The other approach to the estimation of volatility that we consider together is the so-called implied volatility approach. The implied volatility approach does not rely on past data, so it's not an historical approach, it's not a backward-looking approach, but it is more a forward-looking approach that relies on the expectations on the market, at least those expectations that we can extrapolate by looking at the prices on the market. So, to compute the volatility using the implied volatility approach, what we just need to do is to solve the following problem. Imagine that we have a European coal and we know that its value at time t is equal to the pricing formula we have considered. So, ct is equal to st phi in d1 minus k e to the minus r tau phi d2. And we know that d1 and d2 are the quantities that we have considered before. Now, imagine that the quantities ct, st, and k, and all the others are known apart from sigma, which is the quantity that we want to estimate. Sigma can be easily obtained via numerical methods. So if I want to get an estimate of the volatility using this approach, what can I do? I can just look on the market for similar options, for similar options with similar uh, maturities, with similar strike price, and then looking at the price of the options, the value on the underline, and so on, I can extrapolate the estimate of sigma that I can take as a reference for my own evaluations for what concerns my own option. In this way, I'm essentially having a look at the expectations that other agents have on the market for what concerns a particular type of time framework, of financial structure, and so on. As you know, numerical methods are not the main topic of this course. You have computational finance for that. But what I want to show you is a very, 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 and allow me to add an extra very simple code to use and to estimate volatility in the implied framework using R. Now, what I will show you is just a very simple example is not a fancy one. For the fancy ones, I refer you to my colleagues in computational finance. Consider this simple R code and imagine that these are the quantities that are known to us. The market value of the coal, the value of S0, the time length, and so on. What we want to find is the value sigma v, which is our volatility. What we have to write down is nothing more than the value of our call option, using the formula that we have considered, make this value equal to the market value that we have observed on the market, and then solve for sigma v. Using unit root, for example, in R, which is not for sure the most sophisticated tool, but just to give an idea, gives us the value of our volatility, which is around 0 0.18. Okay, let's now change the topic of the discussion. So for a moment, we just leave volatility there. We will be back because volatility is very important for us, but we need to add some extra materials. Now, let's go back to the European call we were considering, and let's consider the pricing formula we have derived. That is to say, that pricing formula that considers the difference of the two CDF of normal distributed random variables, one in D1 and one in D2. Okay, looking at that formula, we can say many interesting things. The first things that I want to stress is that the two probabilities that you can read in the formula, capital Phi D1 and capital Phi D2, is not difficult to see that these are probabilities. These are the probability that a standard normal is smaller than or equal to D1 in the first case and smaller than or equal to D2 in the second case. Okay, these two probabilities have a clear meaning 
from a financial point of view, and they are related. What I want to show you is how they are related. And once we discover how we are, they are related, we introduce a quantity that is called the Wang transform, very important in actuarial mathematics, and that later I will also show you uh, has very important connections with other fields of probability and statistics, namely the Lorentz curve in inequality studies. Now, why it is important to study the connection between these probabilities, because we will see that the Wang transform is essentially the function, is the distortion function, that builds the dependence among different equivalent probability measures, not only between D and Q, but also between P, Q, and a new measure that we will call D. So what you see on your screen is the value in T, in small t, of a European call on an asset whose underlying prices follow a geometrical motion, and that we indicate with ST, and a strike price, capital K, when we fix a maturity, capital T. As you see, the formula includes different terms, but what are important for us are the two CDF of a standard normal, capital Phi evaluated in D1 and capital Phi evaluated in D2. You can easily verify, and please do that as a very, very useful exercise, that capital Phi D2 is nothing more, it totally corresponds to the probability to be in the money at maturity, under the risk neutral measure Q. So it is the probability Q of the event S capital T being larger than equal to the strike price K. For what concerns capital Phi evaluated in D1, again, this is a probability, and this is a probability of the same event. That is to say, the probability of being in the money at maturity, so, the probability of the event S capital T being larger than or equal to the strike price K, but the probability measure we are considering to elicit these numbers, to elicit this probability, is no longer Q, and it is not even P. It's a brand new measure that we call D, and that is also sometimes known as the stock measure. We will give more details about the stock measure later in the course when we enter into the actual modeling and into the actual discussion of the importance of the numeraire. But if you want, I can already tell you that the big difference between Q and D is actually the numeraire. In Q, the measure, the risk neutral measure that we have been using so far, the numeraire is the risk-free asset. So the unit of count to evaluate the value of all the other assets on the market is the risk-free asset. In the stock measure, conversely, as the name suggests, the unit of count is the value of the stock itself. So the numeraire is the price of the stock. Now, D, Q, and P are equivalent. They agree on what it is not possible and on what it is possible, but when something is possible, they may give different probabilities, so they may give different masses to the different events. Okay, let's try to see what is the connection between D and Q. It is quite simple in this framework we are considering. The probability to be in the money according to the risk neutral measure is, as we have just said, capital Phi evaluated in D2. But then we can exploit the connection between D2 and D1. So we can substitute D2 with D1 minus sigma, the square root of capital T minus small t. Now, D1 is what? Since D1 is the argument of capital Phi D1, that is the probability to be in the money according to the D measure, D1 itself is a quantile. So we can express D1 
as the quantile of a standard normal evaluated in the probability we are considering. So the probability D of the event as capital T being larger than or equal to K. Now what we observe then is the probability Q is nothing more than the CDF of a standard normal evaluated in the quantile of a standard normal for the probability D minus sigma the square root of the time interval capital T minus small t. If conversely we are interested in knowing how D is connected with Q by just rearranging the terms we find that the connection is exactly the same the only difference is that the minus sign in minus sigma square root and blah 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 becomes the plus sigma square root of capital T minus small t. So the connection between the measure Q and the measure D and vice versa is represented by the one transform. The one transform is the object you see on your screen that involves the CDF of a standard normal and the quantile of a standard normal. Now, the one transform is extremely important. We will say more in the next classes, but what we can already stress is that the one transform is a distortion function. So, since it is a distortion function, we can easily verify that it is zero in zero, it is one in one, and it is non-decreasing. An interesting characteristic of the one transform is that it can be both concave and convex. Everything depends on the sign of the quantity C that you see in the form. If C is positive, the one transform is concave. If C is negative, the one transform is convex. But in any case, it will lie in the unit square. That is a very important square, as we will see when we deal with probabilities. Being a distortion function, the one transform is able to transform one probability measure into another, which is actually what it does when we consider the connection between Q and D and vice versa. Again, more details will follow, but please remember this function. It is extremely important. Now, this is what we can say with respect to the dependence between the Q measure and the D measure when we are considering a very important event for us in the European Code framework. That is to say, the fact that we will be in the money at maturity. And for us, the probability of being in the money, as you can imagine, is fundamental. It means that our option is worth it, that, that, that our option is meaningful. So it makes sense for us to exercise the option. But what happens if, conversely, we are interested in modeling the dependence between Q and P? So how they relate, how these two measures are connected? Again, it is a Wang transform, but this time it is slightly different. So let's see a little bit more the details. Now, the things that we are seeing here are very important, so let's put a disclaimer. Understanding the when transform is important because as I will show you in the next classes, thanks to this transform, we can understand many non-obvious things of options. And these are things that good for us, are not very commonly known, so we can exploit them. Given our assumption of a geometric Brownian motion for the price process, it's very simple to compute what is the probability to be in the money according to the physical measure P, and the probability is what you see on your screen. Now notice that the argument of the CDF of the standard normal can be once again expressed in terms of our D quantities, in particular D2. What is sufficient is just to notice that it is equal to D2 plus mu minus R over sigma, the square root of capital T minus T. So again, what we are able to find is that the probability P can be obtained as a Wang transformation of the probability Q. The only difference is that now the C term is no longer sigma square root of T minus T, but it is mu minus R over sigma, the square root of capital T minus T. 
Now, in the quantity mu minus r over sigma, I'm sure that you will recognize the drift that we used in the cameron martin theorem to move from p to q. But it's also nice to observe that this quantity has a name in finance and it is sharp ratio. It is indeed a measure of profitability that quantifies how much the risk investment we are considering outperforms the risk-free when we are looking at the expected returns. The numerator indeed quantifies the difference between what we can earn with the risk-free and what we can earn from the risky asset and everything is rescaled by sigma, by the volatility, which is perceived in the Markowitz universe as a measure of risk. So we tend to prefer investments that, at the same level of expected return, will give us a lower sigma, because sigma for us is risky. We will see that this is true in the Markowitz framework, but in more general terms, we can say many more things.